Hey, welcome everyone. We're doing another really fun episode of Indie Reads Aloud. This is a fun storytelling podcast where you get to learn about authors that may be new to you and perhaps stories you've never imagined. Today, SW Rain is here. She's my friend Rain. I call her Rain because we're friends and I get to do that. Um, so Rain is here today and she's going to be reading from her urban fantasy the Elemental's Guardian. Welcome, Rain. I'm so glad we could finally connect and make this happen. Thanks for having me. It's going to be super fun. For Absolutely. those of you who have not met Rain yet at one of our many Michigan author events, Rain is a Canadian, born and raised. We don't have, hold that against her at all. <laughs> um, and constantly moved between Ontario and Quebec with her military family. She moved to Michigan in 2004, where she currently still resides with her husband and young son, who is a delightful storyteller in his own right. She always has a she has always had a vivid imagination and loved reading and writing from a very young age. She took courses in children's literature through ICL in Illinois and published her debut uh, new adult steampunk adventure in 2020. She has participated in NaNoWriMo for over a decade and was a municipal liaison for the Detroit region for six years. How many years now have you been participating in NaNoWriMo? This is going to be my 18th year and hopefully my 17th win. I find that remarkable. I just <laughs> think that that's such an achievement. It's uh, it's definitely uh, definitely something. And and we're gearing up for it. Yep. Right around the corner. So this Absolutely. is super, super fun. Um, today, you're going to be reading from The Elemental's Guardian, which I mentioned is an urban fantasy. Can you kind of set up the story for us um, what is this? I haven't yet had a chance to read this book, so it's new for me too, which is always exciting because as I've said before on this program, I'm a six-year-old in recovery and I just love it when people read out loud. <laughs> um, well, um, this is part one of a trilogy and it is, um, heavily influenced by both Sailor Moon and Avatar The Last Airbender. Oh, fun. Yes. So what it happens is in the beginning, um, we have Ferentz, who is a freelance pilot, and he actually runs into Olivia, literally, in his jet in the sky, um, while she was traveling via lightning. And Oh, that's cool. Okay. Yeah, he is a super skeptic. He, like... This isn't happening to him at all. There's okay. no way she could be there on the nose of his jet without squishing like a bug. <laughs> he just doesn't understand it. But basically, she'd been looking for him. And he is the guardian of the air elemental. And then she needs to train him on his abilities. And then they need to find the actual air elemental. Oh, and this is going to be fun. While all of this is happening, there is uh, a society of masked figures with, uh, they can summon these dark, gnarly creatures, and they're always after this poor little homeless girl. And uh, it's because she's something special. <laughs> what fun! Oh my god, okay. Now I'm hooked. I mean... I actually bought this book. I just haven't had a chance to read it yet. So the story of my life. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> my TBR is like six and a half feet count. tall. Yeah. I don't want to count. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's crazy. Um, okay. I'm, I'm super excited to hear you read some of this um, and, and push this book further to the top of my TBR. So <laughs> when you are ready, please take the microphone and read aloud. All right. Um, well, I'll give a little bit of a, a summary of where I will be reading from. I'll be reading from chapter 25 and chapter 26, which um, is Olivia training Ferentz. And um, the homeless girl that um, these dark figures are always after is with them, but she's a very, she's very scared. She's a, she's an introvert. Um, she wants nothing to do with this. So she'll, you know, watch uh, she'll be content with watching. However, um, you know, there's always danger lurking around the corner. So here we go. 
He didn't know what he'd expected. He should have been able to do something, anything, at this point, but all he'd managed to do was get a headache. Farron sat on the concrete next to Dormouse, finishing his cigarette, while Olivia kneeled next to him, working on his fracture, and occasionally applying pressure to a certain spot on his forehead. After dropping Olivia off at her hotel the previous night, he'd returned to his house with Dormouse. She'd been quick to retire, but he hadn't been able to sleep. His mind wouldn't shut off, and he'd spent many hours pacing his property, smoking cigarette after cigarette, researching everything and anything on his phone. Even when he'd forced himself to lie down and get some sleep, he'd found himself right back on his phone, deep in research, until the wee hours of the morning, still no closer to finding a tangible explanation for what Olivia could do. Better? Olivia asked, pulling her hand away. He nodded as he put out his cigarette by his knee. If wanting to protect Dormouse and help Olivia with her mission, whatever that was, wasn't motivation enough to learn how to do the air manipulation, then wanting to know how to heal himself was definitely a factor. Olivia had the magic touch, and while he was grateful, he knew he couldn't have her doing it forever. All right, Olivia said, getting back to her feet. Let's go again. His eyes followed her for a moment, and he couldn't help but smirk. She was all work and no play. After stretching his arm for a bit, he smiled softly at Dormouse before he stood up. Olivia looked expectantly at her, but Ference lightly tugged her sleeve to pull her away. Don't make her do anything she doesn't want to do, he reminded her. She doesn't have time, she replied, slightly sing-song, as they made their way toward the middle of the parking lot. I'm here, right? He opened his arms out. Isn't that enough? For now. His arms fell back to his sides. Look, I'm trying. I know you are. Once they'd reached a safe enough distance from the abandoned building and from Dormouse, who'd remained seated but had turned to face them, they paused and Ference lifted his hands to form his imaginary box. He concentrated on everything Olivia had taught him so far, the fire, the heat, aligning with his emotions, recalling the flow of events that led him to summon a lightning bolt into the tree and blowing the masked figures away. Come on, she encouraged. I know you have it in you. Isn't there some magical incantation or series of moves that would make this easier? Olivia crossed her arms over her chest. I mean, if you want to have a mantra or an affirmation or choreograph patterns to help you, by all means, go ahead. But it's not necessary. I don't use any. That's not true, he said, dropping his invisible box. Olivia opened her mouth to speak, and he quickly continued with his train of thought before she thought he was being accusatory. You do movements. Some are very slight, like how you wiggle your fingers before working on my fracture, or how you took a really deep breath before healing my hand. You even did some circular movement with your wrists when you flew up to the roof. It's no different from forming this box. Olivia tilted her head some, both curious and impressed. Huh, I guess I do. I never realized it. Does it help? He asked. I suppose it does, she replied with a smirk before uncrossing her arms and playfully nudging his arm with her shoulder. All right, Mr. Observant, get back to making that heat already. He chuckled before raising his hands and imagining his box to contain his fire. He focused on it, making sure that it was clear in his mind as if it, as if it was his belief. And then he imagined his campfire, burning big and bright, stuffed inside the box, sealed tight. In all actuality, sealing the fire would have snuffed it, killing off the oxygen, but he knew his box wasn't real. He knew that to make this work, he had to use these abilities, help Olivia, and protect Dormouse. He had to be okay with believing in things that weren't real. He'd done it once before, and he needed to do it again. Come on, I know you can do this. Reach deep down. Feel what you feel when you summon that lightning. He was focusing so hard he could feel the headache returning. Part of him wondered why it was so difficult to do, but the other part of him, the skeptic, reminded him that it was impossible. He had summoned the lightning. It had been a freak accident. Ference had to silent that part of himself entirely. Maybe it wasn't that he'd really wanted to stop the car. Maybe it was fear-based. If he hadn't stopped the car, he had no idea where they would have taken Dormouse and what they would have done to her. He never would have forgiven himself for not being able to rescue her. Ference could feel heat, but he wasn't sure if it was his imagined campfire or his anger. He really wished he knew what the masked people wanted with Dormouse. 
He was convinced Amy's lawyer was involved, but he had no way to prove it. He had nothing but a business card. Richard had denied everything, and even Amy had gotten on his case about it. Terrence! With his train of thought suddenly broken, he swiftly snapped his attention to Olivia. What? he asked. What are you doing? You're just staring at the space between your hands. His eyes dropped and reality set back in. There was no invisible box, and he was just making a fool of himself. This is ridiculous. He headed back to Dormouse, running his fingers through his hair. Wait, where are you going? Smoke break, he said over his shoulder. You just had one, she called back. Yeah, well, I need another one. She huffed, and he felt a twinge of regret, but he didn't turn around. He knew they were out of time, that the masked people could return at any moment, but he needed to process, to apply, and to perfect it. Unfortunately, he just couldn't shove the realistic part of himself down enough to allow the other side to succeed. Dormouse was absentmindedly pulling at the weeds when he sat down next to her, reaching into his shirt pocket for his silver case. She wiped her hands on her jeans, broken pieces of the various weeds strewn about her cross legs. I'm sorry you have to do this. I want to do it, he replied. He lit a cigarette, took a drag, and blew the smoke away from Dormouse. I'm still not convinced I'm this guardian she speaks of, but I know it means a lot to her. Deep down, he wondered what she'd do if none of this worked. Maybe she'd give up and accept that he wasn't who she thought he was, or maybe she'd just keep fighting it and insist he become something he couldn't be. Olivia joined them but kept her distance as she paced, stepping over the cracks in the concrete like they were wide gorges. She was frustrated again, he could tell. And that tightness in his chest tugged at him guiltily each time. He couldn't do anything more. This air manipulation stuff wasn't instantaneous, no matter how much he wanted it to be, for her sake and for Dormouse's. Dormouse reached over, snatching his lighter, and he raised a brow in amusement at her boldness. Pulling another weed from the ground, she flicked the lighter and brought the stem out to the flame, setting it on fire. She did it a few more times when Olivia rushed over, dropping to her knees between them, startling Dormouse into dropping it. Ference pulled back. Whoa, hey, that's it, she said at the same time, snatching the drop lighter. What's it? Your lighter, look at it. She flicked it a few times, but he didn't understand what he was looking at. His lighter had nothing to do with this. Its tiny flame was nothing compared to a campfire. What exactly am I looking at? He finally asked. The click, the the flick or snap, or whatever your lighter's doing to produce the fire. It's a spark, Olivia. When the friction of the flint, can you stop being super smart for just one minute? Ference blinked at her words, insulted, though it, it was technically a compliment. Listen to me. Your spark, as you want to call it, is the result of an action. Earlier, you were talking about affirmations and patterns and what have you. What if this is your action? What if you snapped your fingers or whatever as a sign to your brain to connect your action to your end result? Not actually producing fire because that's not our element, but the heat of it. As strange as her train of thought sounded, it made sense. Snapping his fingers would act as the anchor to rouse, assist, or hold his energy. He hated that he knew about that, having stumbled upon it while researching manifestation, but it did make sense. All right, he said, let's give it a try. Extinguishing his cigarette without having finished it, he jumped to his feet as Olivia handed Dormouse back the lighter. He let Dormouse have it as it would keep her entertained for a while and followed Olivia back to the middle of the parking lot. Remember, though, you still have to tap into that same sensation. You have to connect. Yeah, yeah, easier said than done, he muttered. They stopped at a safe distance, and Fer Ferenc formed his invisible box. But instead of concentrating on how he felt while wanting the tree to stop the car, he focused on his fear. His eyes slowly shut, and he tried to home in on how he felt, thinking he'd let Dormouse down, thinking he'd never see her again. But still, nothing happened. His brows wrinkled in frustration, so he went back over the events in his mind. He wasn't able to catch up to the car on foot. Helpless and struggling to breathe, he couldn't stop the car. He'd wish that something would happen to the car, like the tree they were approaching, falling atop of it. The fear he'd felt, the irritation, he allowed those sensations to flow through him again, but his imagined campfire still produced no actual heat. He remembered the car being on the verge of passing the tree and the panic he felt the desperation. His eyes flew open as an audible gasp escaped him. That was it. That was the feeling 
he'd felt when the lightning struck. He tried grasping the sensation again, digging deep inside as the memory played over in his mind. And when he reached it, he snapped his fingers. His imagined campfire exploded in an instant, and for a split second, it felt like he was on the surface of the sun. He couldn't breathe, and his skin felt like it had spontaneously combusted. Whoa, Olivia cried out, jumping back. Ferenc stumbled back as well. What the hell happened? He asked. You didn't seal your box. He parted his lips to protest, but he had no valid argument. With everything going through his mind, he'd eventually forgotten about the box. Are you all right? He asked instead. She nodded. Are you? I think so. That was impressive. She tried, cautiously approaching. Want to try that again? Not really, he admitted. He didn't want to feel like he was on fire again. Come on. You set your anchor. Now it shouldn't be as difficult to use. Just remember to seal the damn box this time, she added with a playful smirk. He chuckled before lifting his hands, making sure his box was there, as solid as he could make it in his mind, sealed and double locked, just in case. His campfire was in the middle, not snuffed out from lack of oxygen, lack of oxygen. And once his mind was clear, the feeling of desperation roiling deep inside his core, he snapped his fingers again. This time, the heat was contained, though it was still intense enough to be uncomfortable, as if he was standing right next to an actual campfire. That's amazing, Olivia mused, testing out the intensity by placing her hands at different distances. Ferenc shifted his wrist, placing the invisible locked box onto the palm of one hand and let out his held breath. Okay, now how do I stop it? Let go of the feeling. He glanced at her through his invisible box. That's it. That's it. He released the panic and desperation as it dissipated. And it dissipated, along with the intense campfire heat. His body then felt excessively heavy, and he winced at the acute pain as the acute pain in his head returned. Sorry. But he'd done it. He beamed at Olivia, who grinned back, then turned to look at Dormouse. The smile and pride faltered as he watched her from her seated position, chewing her nails. Getting her on board wasn't going to be easy. Chapter 26. Never in his life had Ferenc thought he'd be able to manipulate air. He often woke in the middle of the night from a dead, exhausted sleep, thinking it all a dream. But night after night, they returned to the abandoned furniture store and he, le he learned to manipulate something new. Olivia had also taught him how to do electrical stimulation. His fracture was almost as good as new, thanks to her. And while that was cause for celebration in and of itself, he'd be able to fly again soon. Having to carefully, carefully navigate the hundreds of questions from his doctor and his physical therapist, and even Amy, had proven difficult. Amy had rebuked him during their latest settlement, claiming he'd been faking the accident and injury the whole time. He couldn't fault her for thinking it. He would even anticipated it. But despite Amy's venomous words, he realized that deep inside, that wounded love he clung on to for so long seemed to be resting under a surprisingly comfy cover of indifference. The intense fury toward her big shot lawyer boyfriend, however, burned profoundly. He still couldn't prove Richard's connection to the masked individuals, but deep inside, he knew Richard was somehow involved. So, Olivia started, is anything coming back at all? Pulled from one agglomeration of thoughts, he was immediately shoved into a different set. He mostly learned air manipulation to better protect Dormouse, but he also did it for Olivia. She was convinced he was the guardian to the air elemental and that maybe using all these abilities would trigger something inside him, but nothing came up. No, he admitted. I know you're going to hate this, but no, he cut in before taking a sip of his coffee, caffeinated despite the hour. You try this every day and you really need to stop. What else am I supposed to do? She said through clenched teeth, throwing her arms in the air. I'm stuck, Ferenc. I don't know what my next move is supposed to be. I need to see if it'll trigger something in her. I know this is frustrating for you, but what if, like me, nothing happens? What then? She stood up from the kitchen chair and began pacing, and he moved his feet from his spot, leaning against the counter to give her more room. Then she knows how to manipulate air. I don't see this as a bad thing. I meant for you. Everything, ever think that maybe there is no next move? Maybe you were only supposed to train us, me. He quickly corrected himself when she came to a sudden stop and cast him a look. There's no way the pool, the pole was only to train you, 
while leaving huge, unanswered questions everywhere. Who else is going to explain to me how I can suddenly do all this? Who else is going to tell me the reason I just had to find the elementals and their guardians? How many more are there, and why me of all people? Hey, said gently, setting his coffee down and pushing off the counter to approach her. Placed a hand on her shoulder and lightly squeezed to comfort her. It'll be all right. We'll figure it out. I need her to remember. I know, but she wants nothing to do with this. She's been through a lot, and I won't put the stress on her. That's the guardian in you talking, she said, dropping back into the kitchen chair. No, that's the nice guy in me talking, he retorted, picking up his coffee cup once more. The newly installed sliding door slid open, and Max barged in, followed by Dormouse. Olivia ruffled Max's fur briefly before getting back to her feet and quietly disappearing down the stairs and out the front door without a word. Dormouse, still by the glass door, brought her fingers up to bite at her nails, as she always did when something was wrong. He knew she felt responsible for Olivia's irritation, even if they spoke low enough that it was impossible for her to have heard anything. You did nothing wrong, Ference reassured her before taking a sip. She really wants me to try. You don't have to. I was pretty adamant about that with her. There's no rule that says you have to do it just because she believes you're the elemental. Dormouse brought her nails to her lips again, chewing on them as her eyes glossed over deep in thought. He watched her as he sipped his coffee, and when she finally returned to reality, he pulled her. she pulled her fingers down, hugging herself instead. I'm no one special, she said, dropping her gaze to the floor. And I don't want to be special. I don't like the attention. I've had enough of it lately. He stepped toward her, and she didn't move. She didn't even flinch as she normally would have, which was a great sign. While I don't agree with you on that first part, he said, slowly hooking his index finger beneath her chin and gently lifting it to meet her gaze, I know you've been through a lot. I won't let them hurt you. And I seriously doubt she'd do it, but I won't let Olivia hurt you either, should you decide to join us. I think it's pretty safe to say she's one of the good guys, but ultimately, that decision is yours and yours alone. She swallowed hard and nodded, and he pulled away just as Olivia came back in. You ready? He called out to her as Dormouse's eyes fell back on the floor. Waiting on you, Olivia put, replied back. Down the rest of his coffee to keep himself awake for the next few hours, but his eyes never left Dormouse. Her trust in him was growing stronger. She could keep eye contact longer. She wasn't so jumpy. He just hoped that she trusted him enough to trust Olivia by extension. When Dormouse finally looked back up, Ferenc arched his brows, a silent question asking if she was ready. She nodded in response, and after rinsing his mug, he made his way down the stairs. Let's go then. Ference's exhale was practically a sigh, the cigarette smoke mixing with the air around him as he watched Olivia and Dormouse ahead, walking along the building together in conversation. They claimed to be having a nice, proper discussion, but an empty feeling in the pit of his stomach always made itself known whenever Olivia was alone with Dormouse. He knew Dormouse would quickly retreat if the conversation turned to something she couldn't handle, but knowing how quickly Olivia's irritation surfaced and the fact she was desperate to get Dormouse to start manipulating air, his muscles always twitched in anticipation of it happening sooner rather than later. He dropped the cigarette butt and stepped on it, extinguishing it before joining them. He still couldn't fully grasp how he was able to manipulate air like he did. It wasn't physically possible, yet there he was, doing it like reality didn't even matter. Olivia laughed up ahead and a smirk formed on his lips at the soft giggle from Dormouse. He might have been nervous about Olivia's inevitable requests, but seeing Dormouse smile or hearing her laugh always warmed his heart. It made him light as the air he now manipulated. She deserved happiness with everything she'd been through. What's so funny, he asked, his long legs easily catching up with them. That's between Dormouse and me, Olivia said over her shoulder. Yeah, am I going to have to force it out of you? He teased. You're welcome to try. Olivia spun around with a playful smirk, flicking her fingers at him, which caused sudden gusts to blow in his face. As small as they were, they quite literally took his breath away. Once recovered, he pulled his hand back in fun, readying something of his own, but she darted away. But you'll have to catch me first. She dashed off and he charged after her, quick to take notice of the flick of her wrists as she suddenly pushed up into the air, a small twister at her feet. So she was gonna cheat and take the easy way out, was she? He hadn't been able to replicate that ability quite yet, and frustration mounted through his core. He wasn't going to let her win that easily. That wasn't his thing. Skidding to a halt, he followed her to the roof with his eyes. 
giving up already? She goaded, looking down at him. His attention darted around. There had to be a staircase of some sort nearby. He narrowed his eyes back at her as she mockingly watched on from the roof. He then took a few steps back and arched his arms, flinging them forward as if he were throwing a ball. She easily, easily dodged the gusts, despite her hair flying everywhere, and grinned down at him. Is that all you've got? At this rate, you'll never find out if we were talking about you or not. Being the center of discussion, or not, didn't really faze him. He was just curious about what was so entertaining to get Dormouse, of all people, to laugh. But now that Olivia was making a game out of it, he was all about knocking her confidence down a notch. <clears throat> If she was going to win, then the least he could do was level the playing field. If only he could find some stairs. An idea came to the forefront of his mind. Maybe he could create some himself. If he could somehow manipulate the pressure of the air molecules, he'd have a fighting chance. Focusing on the space in front of his foot, Ference utilized everything Olivia had taught him about manifesting and channeling while throwing in some anchors to help him visualize. He curled his wrists like he was skipping a stone, then lifted his foot to test the theory. What you doing down there? Olivia asked. When Ference put his foot down, he stepped on something invisible yet solid above the concrete. Perfect. His attention shot back up at her and he smiled mischievously. Wouldn't you like to know? He darted toward the building, curling his wrists, flicking his imagined discs and climbing them toward the roof. The look of surprise on Olivia's face as her mouth fell open was so satisfying. He'd caught her off guard. His chest drummed inhalation, or maybe it was the caffeine, but the feeling was short-lived as his next step missed. His heart caught in his throat and his mind struggled to find a solution to lock onto. This was nothing like falling with a parachute because he had none. There was nothing to latch onto, nothing to slow his fall. I've got you. She snatched him by the wrist, a twister about her feet, and she gasped at, as she struggled to keep hold of him. Control the air around you, Ference. This isn't new to you. She told him, she she had told him before that he'd been controlling the air in the storm. Even if he believed that, he didn't know how he'd done it. He couldn't summon a twister like she could, and he'd somehow, in, in all this excitement, lost his concentration. Now that he thought back on it, that loss of concentration was what caused him to lose control of his jet as well. I'll swing you up on the count of three, she said. Just watch out. There's not much of a roof up here. Ready? One, two. Three, Ference used her momentum as leverage, swaying along as she spun, swinging his arms out to balance himself as he landed on the edge of the roof after she released him. She gripped him by the shirt to keep him steady, not like it would have helped, before she barked in laughter. How did you? A panicked cry from Dormouse below interrupted her, and Ference's stomach dropped in dread. They both turned as a figure approached, nothing but a dark mass cloaked further by the night. Shit, Olivia muttered. What if they saw what we did? Her fear was valid, but he was more worried about the other concerns from a few nights ago. Drug addicts, convicts. A glint caught his attention and his hands formed into fists as the light from the parking lot revealed a familiar sight. A silver filigree mask. Dormouse, he said with a silent gasp. Before he could react, two more recognizable forms seemed to appear from the ground itself. The creatures, with their glowing eyes, snarled dangerously, making their way toward the only one of the three not on the roof. The hairs on his arms and the nape of his neck bristled as his stomach dropped. Dormouse! Thank you very much. That was super fun. Super fun. Um... What was the most challenging part about writing urban fantasy for you? I know that your other two books are steampunk, and this is very different. So what what was the challenge that you found in sitting down to write this story? Um, the challenge definitely wasn't in the writing, surprisingly. It was in the editing. Okay, how um, come? Because... Urban fantasy has a very, um, it has a specific formula. And as a pantser, I just kind of wrote just to write. Mm -hmm. And then when it came to editing, I had to suddenly make sure I fell, followed this formula. And having written previously to steampunk books, it took me way longer to get used to it for some reason. Well, because your head had been in the other two 
books for yeah, so yeah. long. You were immersed in that universe rather than this. Yeah. I, I would imagine it would be like shifting from horror to Hallmark. There's a a vast chasm of difference there. Yes. Yes. Even though steampunk is technically like fantasy and sci-fi, um, and mine are more on the fantasy aspect anyway. Um, yeah, the urban fantasy is its own thing. Yeah. Um, like I said, it has its own formula and it was definitely difficult for me to um get into. And um because the reader does have an expectation when you give them a certain book in a certain genre, they say, yes. oh, this is what this is about. Yeah. So you can't just go off the rails with it in the editing process. You kind of have to tighten that. Yeah. And I definitely I'm I'm definitely learning that with book two. I'm still editing book two. It, it should have been done a long time ago, but um, I'm having pacing issues and it is the pacing issues that. I didn't have with my steampunk and now all of a sudden it's a problem in the urban fantasy and it's just uh it's really weird it really is yeah yeah every new genre we step into there are little um idiosyncratic things about each one that that we have to dive into and learn about yes that's absolutely. that's why I, it's part of why I find writing in different genres so much fun is because it is. It you is fun. can't that's allow actually... yourself to get complacent when you write multiple genres. That's actually how I got into writing steampunk because as I was doing NaNoWriMo, once reaching 50,000 words was no longer a challenge, mm -hmm. I started challenging myself to write in different genres. Yeah. And I discovered that, wow, writing steampunk is really fun. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Thank you so much, Rain, for coming on. I can't wait for you to come back and read for us again. This Thank was super so fun. This was super fun. It was fun. Thank you, my friend. Have a great day. Thank you.